A priest was on a transcontinental uh, flight, a flight from Boston to San Francisco. He was sitting in a seat, and right before it took off, somebody came and sat next to him. Must have been a standby sort of uh, passenger. So anyway, the plane took off, no problem. Got to its cruising altitude, no problem, and was on its way for those several hour flight to get into San Francisco. After they had sat there for a while, the fellow sitting next to the priest tried to start a conversation with him. And in the middle of the conversation, he just asked him, do you really believe in eternal life? And before he got a chance to respond to it, he went into a tirade. Well, I don't. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in eternal life. When you die in this life, it's over and done with. I believe in science. I believe in evolution. I believe in, you know, survival of the fittest. Eternal life, God, ha! And then there was a period of silence. So the priest, with a smile, just said, well, thanks be to God. <laughs> the priest responded as best he could given the circumstances. And that man who was sitting next to him, well, he still has the chance to change his mind and heart, doesn't he? But our gospel says he better be in kind of a hurry because you never know when the master is coming back. We heard proclaimed, you do not know when the Lord of the house is coming, so may he not come suddenly and find you sleeping. Better be awake, huh? Watch. The three writers we hear from on this first Sunday of Advent, when they originally wrote, had no idea that what they wrote would be used in a liturgy in preparation for the great feast of Christmas. They each had a unique place to play in salvation history from an historical perspective. So today, instead of placing these readings necessarily in the context of Christmas, I thought we would put them in the context for which they were written and see what we can learn from them. First up, the prophet Isaiah. And it's the Isaiah that scholars call Trito Isaiah, the third Isaiah. There are at least three different authors within that book. Now, he's writing at a time when the people were able to come back from the Babylonian captivity. The only way you can really appreciate this reading in its context is to kind of close your eyes and develop a mental picture. Pretend like you're one of the people that have come back from Babylon and you're standing in the ruins of what had been the Temple of Solomon. You see, in 586 B.C., the Babylonians, the superpower of its day, had destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, taken the best people, the cream of the crop, the aristocrats, so to speak, and moved them into Babylon in captivity. But in 530 B.C., the Persians had conquered Babylon. Now, the Persians, despite their bad press with regard to their fights with the Greeks, were fairly lenient to the people that they conquered. And in fact, Cyrus the Great, and he's called the Great for many reasons, put out a proclamation that said the Jews could go back to their homeland and rebuild Jerusalem and the temple if they wanted to. In fact, the Old Testament calls Cyrus the Persian the anointed, the Mashiach the Messiah in that sense of being anointed. In other words, an agent of God. He's acting on behalf of God to issue this proclamation. So some of the people gathered their goods and went back to Jerusalem with the idea of rebuilding. That's what you got to have in mind. And you're standing within the ruins of this temple and the city and everything else. And suddenly, what should have been an occasion of great joy you've been allowed to return, is one of anxiety. Because you look around and you say to yourself, this is too hard. It's a lot better being back in Babylon. So many of those first group that came back 
wrote letters to their family and friends that said, stay put, at least for a while. You're better off over there in Babylon than coming back here and having to do this task of rebuilding everything. Now, the prophet Isaiah had a greater insight into this. He knew that if the people did not first rebuild their relationship to God, have a conversion of heart and mind, they were estranged from God. If they didn't do that first, it didn't matter whether or not they rebuilt the temple or not. The temple would be, when it's built, an outward sign of the relationship of the people to God. And so we hear this lament from Isaiah throughout that first reading. Why do you let us wander, O Lord, from your ways? You know, uh, there is none who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to cling to you. So Isaiah knew, first, we've got to rebuild ourselves before we rebuild our temple and be able to offer sacrifice again worthily to God. That gets us to Mark. Mark is writing about 10 years after the correspondence we heard from 1 Corinthians from Paul. Mark is concerned because even though Jesus didn't come back, and it's around the year A.D. 70 now, uh, he still expected him back any time in the lifetime of those who would hear or read his gospel. So he's concerned because he wants the people to be where they should be, doing what they should be. A little story, hopefully, to illustrate what I'm talking about. And I know this has happened to everybody here. Pretend you're back in grade school. And the teacher says to you, I've got to step out of the classroom for a couple of minutes. And I expect you to behave in my absence. Okay? Take your reading book out. Read quietly. I'll only be gone a couple of minutes, and then I'll be back. And she steps out. And for about two minutes, that happens, right? Then after two minutes, spitballs start flying. Everybody starts running around the classroom and everything else. And you know that when that teacher comes back in, there's going to be a reckoning. There's going to be something to pay for not obeying her. And so that's what Mark is scared of. He wants the people to be alert, to be watchful, to be vigilant, to be where they're supposed to be, doing what they're supposed to be. So we keep hearing these warnings. Be alert, be awake, be vigilant, watch. Okay, we're 20 centuries later. So the slogan in AD 70 was, be alert. What is it now? Be alert. Even though we don't think he's imminently coming back, a week from Thursday, we still know he's coming back. He's been delayed for 2,000 years. And we can be like those kids in the classroom and lose track of that and start going off on our own way and not be where we're supposed to be doing what we're supposed to be. So how can we stay alert? We can stay alert by doing what Isaiah was telling us in that first reading, to change ourselves. See, the season of Advent is a good time to do an inventory of our relationship to God. First of all, the question should be, do we have a real relationship to God? And if we do, is it what God wants it to be? Does it need to be rebuilt the way he was telling those people in 530 that they had to rebuild their relationship to God before they rebuilt that edifice that they worshiped in called the temple? Do we need to rebuild our relationship? And the season of Advent is a good time to begin that rebuilding. I read someplace that there was a very popular bumper sticker some years ago, and it went like this. Be alert. We need lots of alerts. And don't we? Yeah. 